This is Bible teacher Nelson Walters. And you may not realize this, but the account of the Tower of Babel is not just found in the Bible, although that is the only completely accurate account. But it is also found in numerous other cultures. Why is that? Well, obviously, because it actually happened and because it was the event that separated peoples based on languages. So it was an event that led to the cultures of the world forming. The flood and the tower were two events then that have universal stories in all cultures. Some have the story in their legends. Some, like the Chinese, even have the story embedded in their written language characters. The Tower of Babel account is universal, and it is now returning as a symbol of the coming one world government that the nations are trying to build, to return to a single language and a single government. Today, we're going to discuss both aspects in detail, the evidence for the tower in other cultures and the evidence of today's modern world that it's coming back. And even more importantly, what the Bible has to say about all of these things. Let's start with the ruins of a tower in ancient Babylon which may be the remains of the original Tower of Babel. The Entamenaki, or House of the Foundation of Heaven and Earth in ancient Sumer, was famously rebuilt by the 6th century BC Babylonian dynasty rulers, Nabopolassar and Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah, that guy. But they've fallen into disrepair by the time of Alexander's conquests. He started to rebuild it. Alexander wanted to rebuild the Tower of Babel. Did you catch that? Maniacal dictators like Nebuchadnezzar and Alexander seem to always want to rebuild the Tower of Babel. But his death stopped the reconstruction and was demolished during the reign of the successors, you know, the Antiochuses. And the stones were used for other buildings. These remains can still be seen on Google Earth from aerial shots. Very, very interesting. In the Bible, the account begins like this. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. They said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Genesis 11, 1 and 5. Now, if you know your Bible, you know this was in direct disobedience to God's commands who had told Noah and his descendants to fill the earth, to be dispersed. Some accounts not in the Bible contend that part of the reason they were building the tower was to escape a future flood. God, of course, had promised to never flood the world again. So if this was true, this was a sinful ignoring of God's promises as well. But before we look at other religions, Let's consider what the Jewish Roman historian Flavius Josephus says in his Antiquities of the Jews from 94 AD. He wrote that it was Nimrod who had the tower built, that Nimrod from Genesis was a tyrant who tried to turn the people away from God. In this account, God confused the people rather than destroying them because, you know, annihilation with a flood hadn't taught them anything. It hadn't taught them to be godly. Now, here's what Josephus says. Now it was Nimrod who excited them to such an affront and contempt of God. He was the grandson of Ham, the son of Noah, a bold man of great strength of hand. He persuaded them not to ascribe it to God as if it were through his means they were happy, but to believe that it was their own courage which procured that happiness. He also gradually changed the government into tyranny seeing no other way of turning men from the fear of God, but to bring them into a constant dependence, catch that, on his power. Now the multitude were very ready to follow the determination of Nimrod and to esteem it a piece of cowardice to submit to God. So this was the initial one world government. And notice the means he used for turning people away from God, according to this account, through tyranny, and through ascribing good things to man's effort and not to God's blessing. Ha! Huh, sounds very familiar. Sounds like our modern world, doesn't it? There is nothing new under the sun, after all, as we're told by Solomon in Ecclesiastes. 
Another ancient Jewish historian was Pseudo Philo. His records indicated that three men were in charge of the building project, Nimrod, who is made prince of the descendants of Ham, and two other men. But not everyone went along with the building. According to Philo, 12 men were arrested for refusing to bring bricks. This may also be similar to our modern world. Those who don't go along with the one world government will likely be punished. Now, let's look at other cultural stories. There is a Sumerian myth, similar to that of the Tower of Babel, called Enmerkar and the Lord of the Arata, where the Enmerkar of Uruk builds a massive ziggurat in Eridu and demands a tribute of precious materials from another city for its construction. He also supposedly implores the gods to disrupt the linguistical unity of the world. So in that one, the king... <laughs> supposedly is the one who wants the linguistic unity disrupted. Of course, that makes no sense, but you could see a king saying, yeah, yeah, I was the one who did that. It wasn't God. It was me. In Greek mythology, much of which was adopted by the Romans, there's a myth referred to as the Gigantomachy, the battle fought between the giants and the Olympian gods for supremacy of the cosmos. Carvings of this battle are found on the altar of Zeus, or what the Bible calls the throne of Satan from Pergamum. You know, this is mentioned in the book of Revelation. The giants attempt to reach the gods in heaven by stacking mountains one on top of another, but they're repelled by the king god Jupiter's thunderbolts. Now, a lot of similar Tower of Babel accounts are found in Central and North America. The ancient Toltecs believed that after a great flood, People erected a tall zakulai, or tower, to preserve themselves in the event of a second flood. However, their languages were confounded, and they went to separate parts of the earth. Think about it. Think how uncannily similar this is to the biblical account. First a flood, then a tall tower, then separation of languages, and then the people went to separate parts of the earth. I mean... If that isn't almost identical to the Bible, I don't, I don't know what is. So you must ask yourself, how did the Toltecs come up with this legend? The Tohono Oduham people of Arizona believed that Montezuma escaped a great flood. Interesting that that was the name they gave to the Noah character. Then became wicked and attempted to build a house reaching to heaven. But the great spirit destroyed it. The Cherokee Indians of North America also believed their people decided to construct a huge tower, reaching the heavens to protect them from a flood. They believed this happened when we lived beyond the great waters, where there were 12 clans belonging to the Cherokee tribe. And back in the old country in which we lived, the country was subject to great floods. So in the course of time, we held a council and decided to build a storehouse reaching to heaven. When it reached the highest heavens, the great powers destroyed the apex, cutting it down to about half its height. But the tribe was determined to repair the damage done by the gods. But after it was completed, the gods destroyed the high part again, and the language of the tribe was confused or destroyed. I find the mention of a land across the great waters and the mention of 12 tribes like the 12 tribes of Israel to be absolutely fascinating. Again, where did this come from? The Choctaw Indians of North America also have a story about the Tower of Babel. Their creator god, Abba, I mean, I read that and I stopped in my tracks. This is the same name Jesus uses for Abba Father. Abba means father. Originally made all the people to speak the same language. But after they built a pile of rocks to reach the sky, the wind blew the rocks down, separating the people into different groups. On the fourth day, the people found they were unable to understand each other's languages. The Tharu of Nepal and northern India also have similar tower stories. According to David Livingston, the people he met near Lake Nagami in Botswana, Africa, also had a tower story, but with the builders' heads getting cracked by the fall of the scaffolding. The written Chinese language is one of the oldest on earth, so it's not surprising 
that its written character for tower has implications from the biblical account. There are four parts. The first part means dirt. The second part means grass. The middle part means people. And the fourth part means one. Taken together, the last two segments, one people has another meaning, to speak. And combined with the second element, it means united. So people with the united speech is in view. The grass growing in dirt is also interesting and may refer to the tower after it lay in disrepair after God confused the languages. So other than the Tower of Babel account, what other possible reasons would the Chinese have for using these symbols in creating the character for tower? The Tower of Babel is a deeply embedded story in many cultures, as we just saw. As for Christians, it's an account of man's rebellion against God and an account of a great sin. However, modern globalists actually see it as a symbol of what they want to accomplish, a one-world government. The 60-meter-high European Parliament building in Strasbourg, France, was designed to look like the Tower of Babel. It was intentionally left unfinished, just like the real tower. And it consciously mirrors the Vienna painting of the Tower of Babel from Renaissance painter Peter Bruegel. There's a rumor that seat 666 is left vacant in this building. I was unable to confirm whether this is true, but a seating chart from the recent years did show that that seat is unoccupied. Is it being left vacant for a special future member whose name might equal this number? <laughs> well, who is to say? A spokesperson for the European Parliament, when asked about this building, said they knew what the Tower of Babel was and what it meant, that it represented an open defiance of God's authority and a return to global government, just like Nimrod's government in Babylon. This representative said they were attempting to do what Nimrod and those of his empire failed to do 3,500 years ago, to overthrow God's authority and create a global government. <laughs> that is quite a statement. At the time of the founding of the European Union, a poster was distributed using the Renaissance painting by Bruegel that we talked about and the 12 stars of the European Union flag. But in this poster, notice the 12 stars are inverted. They're upside down, and that was not an accident. This is a known satanic symbol of Satan. They want it to look like the Baphomet, with the two upper points representing his horns. And the slogan on the poster is many languages, one voice. In other words, an undoing, so to speak, of God's punishment of the dividing of the languages. If this building is based on the Tower of Babel, what can we learn about it? In Genesis 11, this is what the people of Babel said about the tower they were building. Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Genesis 11, 4. We already discussed how the refusal to fill the earth was a direct contradiction of God's command to Noah. Making a name for themselves does not mean becoming famous. Rather, it speaks of authority, that they wanted the authority to make their own decisions rather than obeying God and doing things in his name. They wanted to do it in their own name. They did not want that authority scattered across the earth either, but rather wanted a singular government. These are exactly the two things that the EU parliament desires to do according to their spokesperson, defiance of God and development of a one-world government. The second most blatant Tower of Babel symbol in the world today is the replacement that was built for the World Trade Center towers in New York City. In place of the Twin Towers destroyed in 9-11, a single one-world trade center was built, stressing the one-world aspect as in one-world government. Other major buildings like Israel's Azalee Spiral Tower being built in Tel Aviv, and the Amazon Helix building outside of Washington, D.C., both 
have that Tower of Babel look. Globalists just seem to love that look. Now, where in the Bible is this future one world government found? Because, you know, it's one thing to build a building that looks like the Tower of Babel and to say that you're even trying to redo what the Tower of Babel did. But is it prophesied? Well, actually, there are two coming governments that the Bible prophesies in Revelation 17 and 18. The Beast Empire, which most know about, and Mystery Babylon. Babylon as in Babel. In fact, although our English Bibles differentiate between the names Babel and Babylon, in Hebrew they're actually the same word. So it is a direct reference to ancient Babel where the tower was. Now, if you're not a follower of this ministry, this might surprise you that there are two coming evil one world governments, Babylon and the beast. Most only think there's one, the beast empire, but that is not accurate. Babylon comes first and then the beast destroys it and takes over. Initially, Babylon rides the beast. Riding is a symbol for steering or controlling. So initially, Babylon is in charge. In fact, Babylon is initially in charge of the whole world. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth, Revelation 17, 18. So Babylon has dominion over all the kings, including, as we said, the beast and the ten horns or ten kings. But these rise up and overthrow Babylon. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. Revelation 17, 16. That is the point that the beast takes over. So will the entity we call Mystery Babylon exemplify what its predecessor, Ancient Babel, did in terms of trying to unite the world? Obviously so, because it has dominion over all the kings of the earth. Notice, these kings still exist. There are still kings, presidents, rulers, and nations, but this entity has control over them. It has dominion over them, as the Bible says. So it is some kind of system that is going to control the nations. The nations are going to surrender their sovereignty to it. And Revelation tells us who runs this one world government and how they take control. Your merchants were the nobility of the earth because all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. And the blood of prophets and saints and of all those slaughtered on the earth was found in you. Revelation 18, 23 through 24. This is shocking. Here we learn the nobility of the earth are the merchants and they become this by deceiving the nations. Now, nowhere in history have the nobility of the earth been merchants before. They've always been military people or families that inherited something. Now it's the merchants. Now the word translated nobility is megastanes, meaning great ones, satraps, or chief men of the world, not the kings, and they become this by deceiving the nations. Specifically, this is said to happen because of sorcery. Now, the actual Greek word is pharmakeia, which Strong's defines as medicines, drugs, or smells. You probably noticed that this word sounds like our English words for pharmacy and pharmaceuticals, so that is very interesting. Might medicine or drugs developed for satanic purposes be the means by which the merchants or corporations take power in our world in the end times? That seems to be what this passage is saying. And this power leads them to slaughter many, both Christians and non-Christians. This seems to be the path by which the one world government comes to power and what we can expect in the future. The concentration of power in one place, not the scattering of power over the face of the earth. Very Tower of Babelish. And ultimately, this move to a one world government will also lead to one language. How? Possibly through transhumanism and hooking up brains to computers. If everyone is linked to a computer, they can communicate with each other mind to mind. This is not found in the Bible, but it is something that seems to have some truth and possibility in today's world. Now, the World Economic Forum 
are taking the lead in regard to this move to transhumanism, the creation of a new human-like species. Click right here to keep watching and learn what the maniac World Economic Forum spokesman Yuval Noah Harari has to say about his desire to end the human race. Yes, you heard that correctly and start a new one. Till then, this is Nelson and I'll see you there.